You might be wondering why I'm at a Buddhist monastery if I'm talking about the history of secularism. Well, I spent the last two years documenting the evolution of secular ideas for a new book that I'm working on, and that research has led me to some remarkably unexpected connections. So here's a summary of that evolution. Join me for a short history of secularism and the road to the modern world. First, a little context. The Zoroastrian religion materialized in Persia during the 500s BCE. It is monotheistic, but also dualistic, such as true-false, good-evil, light-dark. This is an absolute principle they apply to everything. This dualistic concept had a ripple effect on the rest of human history. Zoroastrianism influenced the Jewish exiles in Babylon when the Persian king, Cyrus the Great, freed them and some returned and founded Second Temple Judaism. Within Second Temple Judaism, Jewish theology began to evolve along these Zoroastrian lines, such as the Satan character transforming into a being in eternal opposition to God, as with Uhura Mazda and his foe Ahriman in Zoroastrianism. Those familiar with the Old Testament story of Job, which is a book that was written centuries before the Babylonian exile, will note Satan needs to be set free to perform God's little experiment. But in the later Zoroastrian-inspired literature of the Second Temple era, Satan becomes an independent character acting freely. In fact, Satan only appears as a fully formed character in the Hebrew Bible in only a single verse at the very end of the Jewish ordering of the books. Now, this dualistic, messianic, apocalyptic Second Temple theology was absorbed by later Christians and Muslims, who had inherited these Zoroastrian ideas of God and Satan in eternal opposition. But that's only half the story. In 515 BCE, the Persian king Darius I conquers the Indus Valley, and by 510 he's reconquered Ionia, which is in western Turkey today, and then conquered Thrace across the Bosporus on the European side. The empire spanning from Greece to India has two effects. One, Persian administrators and soldiers bring these dualistic absolutes with them to the Indus Valley, and this idea that there are absolutes annoys Buddha who rejects it and founds his philosophy of the middle way. There are no absolutes. And that second effect of the Persian Empire spanning from Greece to India? Remember I said Ionia had to resubmit? It had been conquered by Cyrus around 547. And living in a city on the coast of Ionia was a man named Thales, who, introduced to Babylonian astronomical techniques brought by the Persians, kicks off the whole of Greek philosophy and critical inquiries into the workings of the natural world, i.e. not theological explanations. Philosophical inquiries into the natural world lead us to Democritus, a contemporary of Socrates who does two things. First off, he speculated on the rise of civilization from our primitive state of nature and surmised that the gods were an invention from the dawn of human society. Some scholars think Democritus wrote an anonymous treatise known as the Sisyphus Fragment because it echoes his thinking on gods as control mechanisms. The Sisyphus Fragment was a daring statement of overt atheism that appeared roughly 15 years before Socrates was forced to commit suicide for denying the gods. Some shrewd man discovered unto men the fear of gods. Second, Democritus formulated the theory that all matter is made of atoms. This theory of atomism will be important to a later philosopher and obviously in modern physics and chemistry. A few decades after Democritus died, Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire. Traveling with Alexander's army was a man named Pyrrho, and Pyrrho will fundamentally impact the course of world history, and yet I'd wager most of you have probably never heard of him. Remember Buddha's middle way, that we shouldn't have absolutes, and by not firmly adhering to any position we achieve peace of mind, or nirvana? Well, Pyrrho encounters Buddhism, and he brings it back to Greece, where the concept of tranquility in his philosophy goes on to become a central tenet of both the Stoic and Epicurean schools. But it wasn't just a one-way journey, as Greek ideas also influenced Indian philosophies, which I'll come back to shortly. This cross-pollination of Greek and Indian philosophies is well documented by McKeevely and Beckwith. It's the Epicureans who are important to the story of secularism in the modern world. Epicurus picks up the ideas of both Democritus and Pyrrho, bringing together atomism and Buddhist tranquility, and in an unfortunate choice of wording to express Pyrrho's tranquility, he used the word pleasure. This use of pleasure will get him in trouble later by those who deliberately misinterpret the nirvana subtext. For example, in English, an Epicurean is still one who takes pleasure in food and drink. Epicurus equated the soul with the mind, and souls being part of the body and made of atoms will not survive the afterlife. Therefore, there's no need to fear death and the scare tactics of the priests, so he wasn't very popular with religious authority. 
It's also one of the reasons why he's virtually forgotten once the Christians take over, except by Dante, who consigns Epicurus to the sixth circle of hell for denying the soul. And the Jewish word for atheist, because he denied the soul, is Epicurus. Jumping ahead a few hundred years, Cicero was captivated by Greek philosophy and began translating much of it into Latin. And Cicero criticized Epicurean pleasures, just as Epicurus predicted would happen. But it was a man who came of age shortly after Cicero died, an Epicurean disciple named Lucretius, who preserved the philosophy of Epicurus in prose, in his On the Nature of Things. In one of the most striking passages, Epicurus denies that the universe was created by the gods, which he believes in, by the way, but that everything gods included are made of atoms. Elements from which all things created are accomplished by no tool of gods. Lucretius also records Epicurus pondering on dust motes dancing in the sunlight. Mites of matter are darted round, hither and thither, in all directions. I'll come back to this at the end, when we get to the modern world, as I tie it all together. Just over 100 years after Lucretius died, one of the most eloquent students of Pyrrho emerged named Sextus Empiricus, and he's important for a few reasons. Now, Pyrrhonism never became an established school, like the Stoics and Epicureans, but it did have its adherents known as skeptics. Remember the middle way in reserving judgment? Hence, skeptical. Epicurus believed in the gods. But wait, some of you are probably saying he was an atheist, because you've seen this popular quote. Remember, Epicurus included the gods in his atomism, and he considered atheists insane. Also, have you noticed the citation is never given for this supposed quote by Epicurus? That's because it wasn't Epicurus. It was Sextus Empiricus, who wrote something very similar. And remember that two-way transmission of ideas between Greece and India? So this guy whose name in school is on screen, when I will not attempt to butcher with my bad pronunciation, he founded a school of Mahayana Buddhism with concepts so closely resembling those expressed by Sextus, such as what constitutes truth and the suspension of judgment, that many think he was influenced by Sextus. Now, Sextus, transmitting Buddha's middle way, was important in the development of philosophical atheism and was influential for many Renaissance and Enlightenment thinkers who went on to inspire many after them, particularly Montaigne and his famous maxim, What Do I Know?, which directly echoes Buddhist reservations of judgment, and he influences, among others, Descartes, Voltaire, Bale, and Hume. Incidentally, Hume is the one who attributed the quote to Epicurus, but he copied it from Bale, who copied it from Lactantius, an early Christian apologist who got the name wrong. Epicurus, Empiricus, eh, close enough. So, we jump to the Renaissance, when On the Nature of Things by Lucretius was rediscovered in 1417 in a monastery, which you can read about in The Swerve. On the Nature of Things so captured the imaginations of so many that it helped fuel the intellectual fires of the Renaissance. It would be an understatement to say On the Nature of Things dramatically impacted the last 600 years, from da Vinci on Botticelli's artwork to Galileo, but most importantly for secularism, as it had a deep impact on Machiavelli, which, in addition to his Republican works, such as Discourses on Livy, profoundly influenced others. By the 1600s, two writers began reiterating the thoughts from classical antiquity, articulating forceful calls for religion to be subjugated to the state, in essence, to stop them interfering in socio-political matters. The first was Thomas Hobbes, who published Leviathan in 1651, written during the English Civil War with the Puritans. Hobbes was intimately familiar with not only Greek philosophy, but especially with Sextus Empiricus. Remember the Sisyphus fragment? Sextus preserved the most complete copy of it, and Hobbes echoed it in his most famous quote about the state of nature of primitive humanity regarding social contract theory. Twenty years later, Spinoza, an excommunicated Dutch Jew, wrote the most influential work for the development of secularism, the Theological Political Treatise. Spinoza's philosophy was also influenced by Machiavelli, who was inspired by Lucretius and whose discourses helped shape Spinoza's call for a democratic republic, and he was introduced to Hobbes and his social contract theory by a fellow Dutchman, Peter Delacour, who promoted the ideas of Hobbes filtered through Dutch republicanism. The influence of Epicurus, from the creation of the universe to relating souls with the mind, is evident throughout all of Spinoza's writing. Spinoza's ethics, published after his death, also demonstrates distinctly Buddhist elements, as do other writings, such as the treatise on the emendation of the intellect, where he declares, after experience had taught me that all the things which regularly occur in ordinary life are empty and futile. Now, if that 
sounds familiar, it's because Spinoza is echoing a Zen Buddhist concept known as the Sunyata from the Heart Sutra. And Zen is a Mahayana school that may have incorporated thoughts from Sextus Empiricus, the disciple of Pyrrho, who influenced Epicurus with the ideas of Buddha. Spinoza's writings are considered by some scholars, such as Jonathan Israel, to be the start of the Enlightenment, especially given his influence on French revolutionary thinkers Diderot and Dolbach, and the secular republic that France became. The U.S. is also a secular republic, and Jefferson was a huge fan of On the Nature of Things by Lucretius and declared himself an Epicurean. The Epicurean maxim to seek pleasure, though omitting the Buddhist skepticism in attaining peace of mind, even made it into the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Following the chaos of the French Revolution, Auguste Comte recognized what Buddha had about absolutes, writing, The inevitable passage from the absolute to the relative is one of the most important philosophical results of each of the intellectual revolutions. Ernst Mach, the guy you know from the sound barrier, takes the idea of no absolutes and formulates it into the principles of Machian physics, writing, but if we take our stand on the basis of facts, we shall find we have knowledge only of relative spaces and motions. For me, only relative motions exist. You know where I'm going with this, because Einstein credits Mach, writing in 1930, it is justified to consider Mach as the precursor of the general theory of relativity. Not only does Einstein use Mach's principle of relativity to formulate one of the greatest scientific achievements, but his 1905 paper on Brownian motion calculated the movements of pollen particles in water, proving the atomic theory described by Democritus and Epicurus. So, how did we get here? Zoroastrian dualistic absolutism emerges, which influences the Jews, freed by Cyrus the Great, who conquers Ionian Greece, kickstarting Greek philosophy through the Babylonian astronomy that inspires Thales, then Darius I conquers the Indus Valley, where Zoroastrian absolutism is rejected by Buddha, whose middle way philosophy inspires Pyrrho, a Greek philosopher in the tradition started by Thales. Pyrrho brings Buddhism into Greek philosophy, which influences Epicurus, who helps ignite the Renaissance, whose ideas influence Spinoza, who then sparks the Enlightenment, where Diderot, Dolbach, and Jefferson incorporate the secular republican ideas of Spinoza and Epicurus's pursuit of happiness into their republics. Several decades later, Comte and Mach realize that absolutes are a bad idea and everything is relative inspiring Einstein's famous equation, who proves the atomic nature of matter by calculating Brownian motion that Epicurus pondered in the floating modes of dust. So from the Zoroastrians, the world got the three Abrahamic religions, but it also got Buddhism, which got incorporated into Greek philosophy, which led to secularism and the modern world. Pretty cool, eh? So thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe, or leave a comment on videos you'd like to see in the future. This information is in my new book, In Progress, Dangerous Ideas, or you might enjoy my previous book, Manifest Insanity, which documents the origins and evolution of Judeo-Christianity. You can follow me on the social media links provided in the description. Thank you.